Welcome to Bonehead Weekly. And I in no way able to explain tonight's topic. It's going to have to be James. Dr. I actually kind of liked, I actually, when James brought it up, I really enjoyed it. So it, this one was tough because I think I'm going to go a different way because I didn't have an easy time figuring some of this stuff out. Oh, I totally, you don't, I totally, I totally had fun with this one. Oh, this one's easy for me because yeah, you, it was for me too. You don't have an easy time with easy cheese, sir. That's the you issue. The point is, so the, the topic what I'm just saying, what did that even mean? I'm saying you make everything difficult. Uh, the point is, see, now you're going to make this episode difficult by trying to come back at me. And I could have, uh, I could have gotten really serious before James says the topic. I put the list together, and I was like, man, I'm going way too serious with this. And I just could, nope. No, I, but once I say the topic, if you start to think about it, there's so many things that pop up. There's going to yeah. be a ton that we don't talk about. I'm sure. Oh, there's going to be a ton. But this week, so so Chad mentioned this in an episode we did recently. I'm like, that's an entire episode in of itself talking about this topic. And the topic is poems in pop culture. And so, Chad, why don't you go first and kick us off with the one that made me think of this as a topic? Because I think it does set us up well to show when you think about it, when you think about pop culture, films, television, video games, comic books, all these things. There's all these poems that are created for these forms of material that escape from them, that people outside of that one thing still know it, or still are at least vaguely aware of it. And so, Chad, if you don't mind, I'll let you kick us off. Yeah. Um. One second, because I did not. Ha- I would. I thought I had this pulled up, and I during did not. this during this interlude, I'll um sing the song of my people. Okay. My um, milkshake bring. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yes. Um. What the hell? No, that's not. I don't think that's how that starts, Chad. I'm pretty sure I've heard it a few times. Maybe it's one of them alternate ones. This is killing me. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I don't know what rabbit hole he's going down, but I, the rest of us can't see either, folks. So don't okay, feel left out. No. Uh. So this was. Uh. This is one of my favorites. Um. It's from comic book lore. Um, and this is what made us inspire us to do this topic. Uh, it's in brightest day and blackest night. Let those who worship evils and mo- evils might beware my power. Green Lantern's might. Green Lantern's light. I already fucked it up. I already fucked it up. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, th- it's a great poem um, from the comic book lore. It's the it's the oath slash poem that the green lantern has to say basically every 24 hours uh, to recharge his la- recharge his power ring. Um, and if he doesn't, he loses all of his power. Um, what I had to look up that I actually lost, I had I took in this off my, uh, my uh, notes. Uh, it was actually created by Alfred Bester. Yes. Ah, I know who Alfred Bester is. Yeah. He, uh, in issue number nine, of the Green Lantern comic books. Uh, this was after, uh, if you're not familiar, I didn't uh, know they're... he wrote for comics. Oh yes. yeah. Oh yeah. I, everybody did. Harlan Ellison, all of those people did usually under different names, but I think Bester used his own. Yeah. Uh, so this was after, this was, uh, after they reinvented, um, uh, blah, 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 blah. Green Lantern. Um, uh, from the the uh, old version where he was basically afraid of wood. <laughs> hey, a- Alan Scott deserves some credit though. Yeah, Alan Scott is a great. It, uh, honestly, Alan Scott's one is a a, a, a character I really like. Uh, he's the original Green Lantern. It was just he he carved his power ring out of a out of a comet and got his powers that way. But nothing beats the reinvented. Hal Jordan slash Cal, which by the way, my favorite Green Lantern is still Cal Rain. It goes Cal Rainer, Guy Gardner, then Hal Jordan, followed by Jarn Stewart. Um, no, I just love this poem and I love saying it. Um, unfortunately, in my personal opinion, Ryan Reynolds botched the whole saying of it at the end of the movie. But it, in all fairness, that's one of the most memorable parts of that movie, too, when he yeah. finally, it's kind of it's not exactly the same, but it's kind of like when you watch the uh, Marvel movie and you finally get to hear Captain America say Avengers Assemble, 
right? It's, right. Like if you're a fan of that, that's what you went into that movie waiting for. Right. So yeah, that's what inspired us to do this episode was that one poem. Well, and and Chad, I want to say one thing that I appreciate about, uh, and I'm sure you know this more than I do, but is that that's that 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 because the Green Lanterns are quite frankly one of the first equal opportunity employers. Yeah. In comic, it adapts to whatever your culture is, and one of my favorites. So there is. Um, and Chad, if I mispronounce this, please don't kill my family. Um, but Rotlop, Rotlop Fawns, uh, the the creature, the, they're they're it's he's part of an alien species that everything is done by tones, musical tones. Yeah. And so his is adapted to be in loudest din or hush profound. My ears catch evil slightest sound. Let those who toll out evil's knell beware my power, the F sharp bell, because they they view everything through sound. They don't use light, so they're not using vision, so green doesn't mean anything. It's all about the tones. So the Green Lantern Corps adapts it to be sound-based for him. And so I think that's really – those poems are then reflective of whatever culture you're representing, alien culture, human culture, what have you, when you're in that sort of situation. So I I just wanted to add that. I think that's one of the things that – as problematic as the Green Lantern movie is, I'm glad that they did include the fact that there's an entire core of these creatures. Yeah. And that, that, that this entire organization exists that's that's intergalactic. And still, when you hear that, when you hear the oath said out loud by somebody who's really good at saying it, it still like sends shivers up my spine. By the way, quick note, um, and this is one of those things I always forget to say when we talk about the Green Lantern. Do you know who actually, in, who was one of the first creators who actually created the original Green Lantern, Alan Scott uh, James? Is it Bill Finger? It's Bill Finger. I thought it was Bill Finger. Yeah, Bill Finger. I mean, again, uh, we talk about how he, how he's unsung for a lot of Batman. He he's unsung for a lot of stuff. Yeah. So, and if if you all aren't familiar who of Bill Finger, I know we're talking about poems here, but Bill Finger, uh, unsung hero of the man who actually invented Batman, created yeah. Bill Batman. You, I know Bob yeah. Kane. Everybody says Bob Kane. It was Bill Finger. Uh, if, look up if, the documentary. Uh, uh, Batman and is it Batman and Me or? Batman and Bill. I don't. Batman and Bill, like something like that. I'll look it up and. Uh, but uh, no, you're absolutely right, Chad, and it's it's fascinating because and, and that's the point that also gets made, and I I take nothing away from Stan Lee, but Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby's name aren't as well known. Stan Lee wrote a lot of stuff, but the visual elements that a lot of people know came from artists that don't always get credit. Jack Kirby. Batman wrote. and Bill. That's what it was. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Joe, do you, right. do, do you want to go next? Well, I, I kind of do want to go next because mine is, because I couldn't figure out, and I didn't want to ask a bunch of questions because I wanted to save it for the show, of are we just talking about poetry that was just written for pop culture or pop or poetry that was adapted? Not, adapted because I have both. I mean, I whatever, whatever to to well, quote my father. One, whatever will, lots your cookie. Well, okay. Well, I'm going to because the first one I want to do is a famous poet. He's actually England's most famous one arm poet, and it's fascinating because he ended up in two Steve Martin films being quoted, and it's often misquoted and misattributed to Steve Martin. But he was England's first greatest one arm poet. And he wrote two poems. Do, may I read them both to you? Yes, yes. By all means. One of them is an L.A. story, and the other one is in The Man with Two Brains. And they're both in The Man with Two Brains is this poem by John Lillison. Pointy birds, oh pointy birds, oh pointy, pointy, anoint my head, anointy, nointy. Man with two brains. First thing that came to my mind when you gave me this topic. The second one I didn't realize was also John Lillison. And it's an L.A. story where he opens the book and says, may I read a poem to you? In Dillman's Grove. In Dillman's Grove, our love did die. And now in ground shall ever lie. No, none could e'er replace her visage until your face brought thoughts of kissage. These are brought to you by John Lillison. Now, another interesting fact about John Lillison is he was the first person to be killed in a car crash 
1894 in England. And if you have not figured out, this is all bullshit that Steve Martin made up about this fake motherfucker. And he wrote all this stuff. And it's fascinating to me that you can go find websites about John Lillison and his bullshit backstory. He doesn't exist. Hmm. Did anybody know this? I didn't know this. I just always thought it was made up joke and it is, but I didn't know that their actual was that he quoted the author both times in both movies and it's all BS. I mean, but that's it's uh, let me borrow. I fa- from... it was, this was the best part of this assignment was me going down this rabbit hole and accidentally finding all this. But but it, it I, I, it's not a poem, but apropos to your point, the end of Liberty Valance. Yeah. Right. When the le- yeah. when the legend gets so big, you just print the print legend. The legend. It's Steve Martin. It's Steve Martin. Well, I guess Carl Reiner may have had a hand in it if you consider the man with two brains. But I would imagine that that was Steve Martin writing all that that part yeah. because that's a complete Steve Martin joke. Yep. Am I the only one who remembers Oh Pointy Pointy from from the Man with Two Brains for some I must reason? Admit, that's stuck it, in my head, and it's been stuck in my head for twenty something. It's my. It's actually one of my top three favorite Steve Martin films. I'm just going to say yes. You're the only one who remembers, just so I can make you feel bad. It doesn't. So it, 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 it is stuck. It doesn't. It is stuck. It, should. In my, it doesn't. It, it should. In, We're going to keep doing this for the next hour. <laughs> And I'll just ignore you. For over 30 years, it's been stuck in my head because actually, hold on, it went two brains. You should. I'm trying, I'm trying to think. <laughs> Duck season. Actually, <laughs> I prefer, I love the jerk, but if you ask me which Carl Reiner, Steve Martin film I had to pick, it always and will always be the man with two brains. See, I, I, I love the jerk too much, but I also, and I don't think Carl don't Reiner's know, involved, Joe, but, the, but the where does all of brains. me fall? All of me doesn't even fall in my top five Steve Martin performances for some reason. Agree. Yeah. It never just, clicked with me. I haven't seen it in a long time. It doesn't work. I'd almost rather watch Dead Men Don't Wear Plat. Uh, I need to go back and watch that one, actually, because somebody mentioned something from it. And I'm like, you know, I haven't seen that in years. So I need to give it another I shot. And, I, and um, all of me may be different now, too. I was There was somebody brought up a movie to me the other day. And I, 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 don't, I don't get I, it. I, I watched all of me recently, and it just didn't stick with me. But yeah, it's still the man with the man with the uh, man with two brains, um, the jerk, I love Roxanne, the jerk. Roxanne, and but but particular the Carl Reiner, Steve Martin films. It's it's the man with two brains. I do love yeah. Roxanne. He's right. I I have I I could watch Roxanne over and over. So yeah, me too. It's another good one. And yeah. I, I liked L.A. Story when it came out too. I, I know do a lot too. Of people don't get it, but I, I to me it's. Funny. I do too. But yeah, that's but mine. Yeah, I, yeah, dead men don't wear play. I still can't get into either. Yeah, me, <laughs> James, James. Me. Well, oddly enough, and I, I thought uh, Joe might go with this one, but I'm, I'm kind of glad he didn't because I'll just oh, keep. I pulled our... some obscure shit. I'm going to have some more. Oh, oh hey, no, uh, good, Joe. That's what we need, Joe. Yeah, do two. Do two. I don't know what I, I don't know what we're going back and forth about. <laughs> He's just arguing again. <laughs> Is this that <laughs> argument clinic sketch from Monty Python? No, Listen, we're not that talented. An argument was not just the naysaying of anything that I said. Yes, it is. Uh, anyway, no, it um, isn't. I I will keep the Alfred Bester train going. Is it? It's he, Beaster, right? Is it? Bester. Is Bester. it Bester? B e s t e r. Okay, okay, Bester. okay, 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 okay. God, everybody, damn. I'm, I'm going to do the. Second. I'm going to do the original rendition of this, and then I'll do the updated one that appears later in the work. But Joe, you'll obviously know this one. Goyle, uh, yeah, I screwed up. Gully Foyle <laughs> is my name, and Terra is my nation. Deep space is my dwelling place, and death's my destination. Once he survives yeah. that death, he updates it to Gully Foyle is my name, and Terra is my nation. Deep space is my dwelling place, the stars, my destination. Yeah, we talked about the stars. My destination. And if you've never read it, go read it. It is. I mean, some of the dialogues dated. It's an old science fiction book, but for a story about revenge, it is. If you like Mel Gibson's Payback or any of the four hundred different titles that movie is or that uh, novel has been made under, um, somebody just questing for revenge, for lack of a better term, Moby Dick, Captain Ahab style revenge. And losing everything because they can't let go of revenge. 
Alfred Bester stars in my destination may be one of the best examples outside of Moby Dick. And quite frankly, I'm not a big fan of Moby Dick. Um, I have read it. It's not fun. Um, it's good. He just has a lot of filler in it. Uh, but now yeah, let's all let's all learn about whaling to the deepest details. Actually, that, that's I've the never thing read that, it. That's the thing that gets to me. There's an entire chapter about the biology of whales where he goes through how many whale teeth each type of whale has and how some whales don't have teeth. And it doesn't add to the story. It's basically, oh, look, I did some research. Let me make sure I quote everything that I did. Um, it just doesn't work for me. It's narrative. Um, but anyway, I mean, obviously, I'm a better author than Herman Melville because so many people know me. So he wins. But anyway, no. I, it's just a poem that once you read that book, it gets stuck in your head. And it's no, very... all you got to do is die. Then people will know you just like Herman Melville. I don't know. Oh, like James, part. it's, can I talk for a second? When, no, yeah, when you're, no, God, no, specifically said James, they, it's one of my favorite books. I actually, oddly enough, this is the one that I actually introduced the other two when it comes to yeah. literature, but it was because the of, other two trying but, to introduce things to me, but wasn't it your favorite? I'm not putting, trying to put words in your mouth, but wasn't it your favorite book because it was one of John Carpenter's favorite books? And then I, I found out you. about it accidentally because what happened was is I went down a rabbit hole of of Carpenter. You're absolutely yeah. right, and it led me to a, a book that Escaped from New York is basically based on. I have it over here, and it led me to other suggestions he had, and that was and he in an obscure and it's, if I ever get him on stage, hopefully at Scarefest someday. It'll be my probably. I have two questions. That's it, and it'll be. That's going to be a short panel. Well, other people will take over. <laughs> yeah, uh, not I was. As, I would, let me tell you, I was at Horror Hound, and my only complaint is this Friday. And I just sort of went up for a few hours and came home, and then, and that's the last time I'm going to do it because all I end up doing is watching people going. You know, people come here to ask questions, not listen to you ask. I've watched a celebrity ask questions. Yeah, but that's my that's my critique of other people who do my little side gig. So, as I was saying, yeah, he talks about it, Chad, and if one of his projects never got away, so I found the book and read it, and I fucking fall in love with it. And I I remember this like it was yesterday. I was telling Chad the the story of it, and he goes, "Oh, it's uh, oh God, what is the name of that movie? What is the name of that uh, Dumas? It's so yeah, it's the Count of Monte Cristo." Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it is. And I was like, yeah, it is, but it isn't. It, it is that structure, but his obsession in space of just he uh, just how much he obtains and how if he could just let it go. Well, and then, I, I mean, spoiler-ish, I guess. And the Count of but... Monte Cristo, they shit on him even worse. Now, I realize they drive him crazy. Oh, man, I could sit here and talk about it for an hour. Sorry. Well, and by the way, I think I sent you all an interview, um, and I'm blanking on the name, which is terrible because he's done our show, Dark City. Alex Proyas. Alex Proyas has said, uh, I read an interview with him where he said it was it's one he would like to adapt. Yeah. I mean, there's a ton of of very good directors and, and screenwriters who have said, I'd love to do that movie. And it's just never came together. Um, it, it'd but be, I, it's a tough picture to do. Well, and, and so I, I didn't want to bring this up though, because I wanted to do this first because Alfred Women Bester horribly in it. Yes. It, it's, I hate to say it, but it's 1950 science it, fiction. And it is absolutely written by a man in 1950s. It is. Yeah. It, the women are either screaming though, or insane. They're written horribly. Though I, the ultimate villain is a woman, though, correct? Well, yeah, in reality, that's true, too. I, what? I, Did he say something sexist? Uh, anyway, there there goes, you know, there the goes last the of the fans. Bye, um, Barbara. Uh, no, I, I but I, I wanted to point this out because Alfred Bester loved to use rhyming things in his work. And, and it's not as good. It's his better known work, but it's not as good. But he even does it in The Demolished Man. Yeah. Because if you listen to the Demolished Man, so I, I'm doing kind of a two for here, been but a I just, long time. It's I want to get time since I've read both, but yes, I want to get Alfred Bester out of the way. But he used it was he often pointed he would create poetry for his works, and Demolished Man does it really well because Demolished Man, if you're not familiar with, you should read it. It's also pretty good. A I've always dated. wondered. I've always wanted to read that one, and I have yet to do it. It's right it's, over um, my shelf, Jen. Yeah, I've got a copy too. It's but it's um the basic plot to the demolished man is there are psychics, people evolve to be psychics, not everybody is one, and there's this um 
extremely wealthy man who there's this other company and he wants to kill the person that runs that company. But of course he can't think or he'll get picked up and he can't even think out a plan and he hires somebody that can be crooked, but he also has to have something constantly running in his head. And he basically uh, goes to this advertising firm and says, give me the most annoying, <laughs> uh, not my words, not his, but the most annoying repetitive thing that I can keep in my head. And they give him a jingle to repeat that they can't find a product for. And it is. Uh, eight, sir, seven, sir, six, sir, five, sir, four, sir, three, sir, two, sir, one. Tensor said the tensor. Tensor said the tensor. Tension, apprehension, and dissension have begun. And he has to constantly repeat that in his head anytime he's near a psychic so they won't be able to read the fact that he orchestrated this huge murder. It's been a long time. I don't even remember been... the plot. I have read the book. It's over here. And I don't remember the plot. Well, it's it's basically, I mean, the murder happens in the first third of the book, if I remember correctly. But then it's the investigation where they're trying to catch him because they know more or less it has to be him because he's the only other person that would be a rival to this person. And then he finds out there's, there's a twist. And then what happens to him, there's a reason it's called the Demolish Man and all of that stuff. But it's, it's, it's a, it is it's a science fiction classic from its time. Definitely should be read. But I just wanted to point that out. So Alfred Bester does give us the Green Lantern Oath. But then throughout his works, he used a lot of rhymes and poems and things like that. And so I just wanted to give him credit as we close out our first round to say Alfred Bester, man, he pops up everywhere when it comes to poetry, from comic books to his own novels. And if any of these, I think Demolish Man has been adapted a couple of times, um, not into major films, but in, into yeah, uh, in playhouse type yeah. things. Uh, so some of these have been seen the stage and seen television movies and stuff so i just wanted to point that out give a shout out to alfred bester for our first round joe well what i was going to say is we chad next up we got to yeah. get through our next two rounds quick. yeah so uh i'm just i can't read the whole poem it's way too long but just reading the last four lines of this poem will pretty much tell you what it is um it is insanely popular um not as insanely popular as it was, uh, but if you're a certain, if you're of a certain age, you know, you may know the last four lines. Um, oh, somewhere in this favorite land, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere and somewhere hearts are light and somewhere men are laughing and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Bill. Mighty Casey has struck out. Yep. That is from the famous poem from 19 from 1888, Casey at the Bat by Ernest Lawrence Thayer. Uh, from a ballad of the Republic sung in the year. Um, again from 1888. Um, it's an amazing poem. It has been it has been and read in many different formats from cartoons uh to theater guys have you, any of you all heard the name of d wolf hopper no nope. d wolf hopper uh is an a man who was a somewhat renowned person from vaudeville in the early 1800s i mean sorry late 1800s early 1900s he made his entire career of going on stage and reading this poem. Um, I mean, listen, if it's working for you more and more, the older <laughs> I get, I, I, I need agree. one. I, I, I need one for lack of a better term, whatever genre I'm working in, I need one, one hit wonder that'll get me through the rest of my life. Yeah. There is one recorded version of him reading this poem Shortly, I believe it was taken a few years before his actual death in 1935. It may have been like 10 years before his death in 1935. Um, it's the only recorded version of him actually reading this poem. Uh, you should check him out. He is ghoulish. <laughs> I don't know why people actually saw him, went and paid money, and how he became famous for reading this poem. Uh, there wasn't if, much else to do. Yeah, I, and if you see his performance, you're like, why would people go and pay money to see this guy read this poem? Uh, be, because it's a great poem. Honestly, it's uh, I oh. grew up loving this poem because I am a, I was a sports fan. I still am a sports fan. I'm just not as hardcore as I used to be when I was a kid. I love the cartoon. 
I did love the cartoon. I watched, that's how I learned about it was from the cartoon. Exactly. The the Looney Tunes the Looney Tunes uh, cartoon, right? Um, and that's how I got introduced to it. That's exactly what I was gonna say is the Looney Tunes cartoon is what introduced me to this, and I loved every minute of it because I was a baseball fan. Um and this just when James said a pop culture poem, this is actually the first one that hit me. Um, because I don't think any poem I thought bled into pop culture more than one other poem that I hope James brings up <laughs> um, than this one, because it just bled into several different areas and it perfectly captured what was America's pastime for the longest time. Now let's be honest. Baseball has not what it is not as popular as it used to be. Um, but this poem perfectly captured what it, what it was. Um, and if you ever want to, and, and if you ever want to see how people really thought about it, this is the poem that I always recommend reading. I, I'm really jealous because you two have picked out two really good ones that I would have picked out and didn't think of. Oh, you're going to be really jealous about my third one. But I've got all sorts of honorable mentions too. So let's keep. I wanted real. to go a little differently with this because I was having a hard time finding it, and then I started thinking about some of my favorite poetry deliveries in film, and most of mine are always going to, are going to be movies. And my favorite is, it shouldn't say favorite, but one of my, yeah, it is. It may very well be one of the best, most just, just exquisite ways of delivering the poem of Dylan Thomas's in rage, rage against the dying of the light is used in so many movies, but it's only used really well in two. Do you guys know what they are? Pitch Black. It seems like you wouldn't want the dying of the light in that movie Pitch Black. Y'all ever seen no, Pitch Black? No. One is a little bit of Bill Pullman in the long speech in Independence Day, which I stand behind. A dumbass movie, but still works I, works like gangbusters if you it watch was, it. It was streaming on Paramount, not Paramount Plus. What is it? The Paramount Network? Yeah. I was at the gym the other day and it was it was they had it streaming there. And I and it was like, man, I haven't seen this movie in a while. And I got to that part and I was like Ah, man, Bill Pullman saves this. He pulls it off. Pullman pulls it off. He really does. He should not have been probably casting that. I know there's a there's a story I could tell, but he's not the best. Do you know who the best delivery of that in cinema history is? Rodney Dangerfield and Back to School. I, I I'll give you credit. Yep. Yeah. That's I'm not even that's not even partial mm -hmm. credit, sir. I'll give you credit. Rodney Dangerfield doing it to salary doing it to salary. Delivering his <laughs> during his finals to what a element, rage, rage against the machine, and he does the whole thing. And at the end of it, what does it mean? And I'll tell you what it means: you don't take shit from anyone. <laughs> I didn't need to go see the movie or rewatch it to remember it because it's burned. Because I don't take shit from anyone. I'm going to pass these tests. I'm going to blah 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 blah. And it's actually as much as there. His performance in Easy Money is probably closer to Rodney and more subtle Rodney. Back to the back to school. Is there a better Rodney Dangerfield film? Meet Wally Sparks. I like parts of Meet Wally Sparks actually. No, uh, you ever see that Rodney? Or what is it? What's the dog movie? Rover, Rover Dangerfield. Dangerfield. Ah, you never do it on a Christmas tree. A Christmas tree. A Christmas tree. A there Christmas isn't, tree is honestly, sacred to me. There isn't, but uh, there's easy money. I mean, uh, there's there's a few Rodney Dangerfield movies I genuinely love, but yeah, Back to School is Back to School is my favorite. I mean, there's Caddyshack too. I mean, Caddyshack's amazing, and but yeah. it's not a Rodney Dangerfield Dangerfield film. Yeah, no, it's which is good because we have all those great performances throughout that movie. I know this is his amazing quite... performance in Natural Born Killers. He actually is really good in Natural Born. He is. It's uh, too scary. By the way, read an interview. They are doing a retrospective of that movie. It's been 30 years, Chad. And I don't know if you knew this or not. Stone's son was on the set. Oliver Stone's son was on the set. And Rodney apparently walked over and goes, I, I, I don't want to see this shit in front of the kid. <laughs> and seriously, Oliver yeah. Stone tells a story and then goes, ah, he's too young. You don't understand any of it anyway. <laughs> and then they cut to, in the interview, his son going, yeah, I didn't get it. But yeah, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> who's a grown-ass man now yeah 
But I want you to think about when Rodney Dangerfield is the one that walks over to the director and goes, hey, I don't want to see this shit in front of the kid. <laughs> James. Oh, is it, it is me again. Yeah. I'm torn. There's so many I want to do, but I'm going to do one that's near and dear to my heart because it's stuck in my head. It's been stuck in my head probably since I saw it first used in an episode. And and it's, it's something actually me and my wife agree on. Um, Though I know I should be wary, still I venture someplace scary. Ghostly haunting I turn loose. Beetlejuice. <laughs> Beetlejuice. <laughs> Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice, not the, the way I, th- not where I thought you were going to go. Uh, but the animated Beetlejuice. So my wife and I have had this conversation several times. It's it's actually something that we agree on. It's amazing. Like we talk about multiverse because of Marvel films and and everywhere all at once, whatever. Um, I think the Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. That's a different one. Beetlejuice cartoon. I mean, I think Beetlejuice is a character that is obviously existing in multiple realities at all times because the musical Beetlejuice is different than the film Beetlejuice. It even actually starts when they do the power ballad to kick it off and you hear Beetlejuice for the first time going, wait, a power ballad to begin a Broadway show? And such a departure from the source material. <laughs> um, and then uh, and then the cartoon is completely different, but the cartoon gave us that that couplet and it's burned into my head. Anytime I see Beetle, when I was seeing the Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, you know, ads for the new movie, my mind immediately went, though I know I should be wary, still I'll venture somewhere scary, ghastly hauntings, I turn loose, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. I, it's, it's just burning in my head. It is so linked yeah. to that character, no matter whether it's the Broadway musical, whether it is the cartoon, whether it's the live action film. If you say Beetlejuice to me, I guarantee you what's going to run through my head is that couplet. Because mm. I loved that cartoon as a kid. My wife loved it. She, when she was younger, actually dressed up as the Lydia Deets from the cartoon with the triangle uh, spider web cape thing. Um, or the jersey. I don't know what that would be called. I don't do women's fashion. Um, but Joe, yeah. Joe, start re- stop recording. Where's my lotion? What? what? Oh, yeah. No, what? And we're back. Fine. And Chad <laughs> has not masturbated to James. What? Well, not hopefully happen. not to me. I mean, I would assume it'd probably be my wife, but I mean, anyway. Um, <laughs> but that being said, no. So that's the one that popped into my head. So when we had this topic, I was like, I can't. I mean, if I'm going to do my geek cred, if I'm going to do what actually strikes me, it's it. That's one of them. It's it's. I mean, it's a simple couplet, but it's so perfect as the introduction to that show because she says it at the start of the opening credits to open up the Netherworld. And it's yeah. it's burned into my head. I it's it it uh that cartoon, the real Ghostbusters, and a couple other cartoons, I mean the theme songs and everything else are permanently burned into my head. They were part of my foundational, I guess, memories of pop culture because I love that stuff. I mean, the fact that we had Ghostbusters as a cartoon and Beetlejuice as a cartoon, and I have the Beetlejuice animated series trading cards because I I you know, loved it as a kid. Yeah, I had all the Beetlejuice animated stuff. Yeah, and it's it's and the fact now that some of it's getting re released because of the new movie, I saw uh, I saw an ad and it was like, oh, we have the re releases of the Beetlejuice cartoon. And I'm like, I am solidly in my forties. Am I going to have to go get those? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not I'm not kidding. I was like, I may have to run out and look at those. I may have to. It may be something that happens. So yeah, that's. That's my second one. It's because it's near and dear to my heart. And my wife loves it too. Mm-hmm. All right. So my third pick is probably my most serious poem. It's a little gut wrenching. So help me if you whip out hop on pop, I'll punch you in the face. Um, no, it, so just, I hope this isn't too emotional for our, our, our for you all or for our, our listeners. Beans, beans, the musical fruit. The more you eat, the more you toot. The more you toot, the happier you feel. So eat your beans with every meal. Boy, that gets me where I live. <laughs> and here I thought there was going to I'm be sorry, a I'm wearing really my shades. good trigger warning. I would say, <laughs> you can't tell because I'm wearing my shades, but if my eyes rolled any harder, they'd be behind me. Oh, there were so many serious poems. 
so many serious poems. And Which I is just funny out. because I'm going to end with the serious one. And I was so serious. And I'm like, nope, I'm doing the beans. Which everybody says this is a song. And I'm like, I have never sung this ever. No, he, he doesn't sing it. He just raps it. Well, he creates yeah. it. So the he beans, the beans poem has said been said in so many different pop culture references. It has been used by Robert Crumb in in his comic strip Crybaby Blues. It was in the episode of The Simpsons of on the Whacking Days. Um, even uh, Animaniacs is one of my favorite. It's one of my favorite lines in Dot's Poetry Corner. She says an ode to a veggie. Beans, beans, the musical fruit. The more you eat, the more they kick you off the air. If you finish this poem, I still love it. Joe, yep. yes, I have looked up. Yes, the origin of beans, beans, the musical fruit. Yes, why did you start with Joe? You're you, you will know why in a few seconds. Yeah. So help me if it turns out that it was by that fake poet that Steve Martin created. I've oh got my God. several questions. No. I wish that was true. Multiple sites. Do you want to guess who is listed as the author of Edgar Beans, Pope. Beans, the Musical Stephen Fruit? Stephen King. Stephen King. Yeah. They quote the gunslinger as being the original source of this. I don't think that's true. That can't be true. Let me but call Steve up and ask him. I bet if we got, he's on Twitter. I bet if you tweeted at him, he'd might answer it. Yeah. I would I, imagine it's something he may have heard as a kid because I it, feel it, like this has been robots. around for ages, but I have not found any source material that says how, th where this originated from. I'm going I next, could, right? Huh? You, I go next, right? You mentioned, yeah. by the way, this though, going to work out really well, Chad. Because, by the way, I did, uh, my original pick was going to be the diarrhea poem, but it's not, it's a song. And I'm like, oh, son, son bitch, I can't do that one. Because oh, I actually oh, remember. Okay. But, but, Chad, uh, you mentioned the Simpsons episode. And if I remember correctly, the, one of the times, I think it's been the Simpsons a few times, but one of the times that it's in the Simpsons is one of the early episodes when, and Bart gets kicked out of school and they have to place it, find another school for him. He goes to religious school and they're making him do poetry or something. And he goes, can I do a poem about beans? And he, and the, the religious church official says, well, beans were used as food at the, you know, whatever, at some biblical references. And then the next scene is him being chased out of the school and they're all like holding torches and chasing. Yeah. <laughs> I just remember that scene vividly in my head. So yeah, guys. I started with two strong ones and ended on Beans, Beans, the musical fruit. You're welcome, Joe. All right. This is what's funny is because I was going back and forth. And as we were sitting here, I actually changed my mind on my third pick. And I'm not exaggerating a third time. And I said, no, nope, this is where you're going. This makes the most sense. This is means more to you than the one I was going to use. And I'll be damned if it's not Stephen King. Okay. Well, that's what I was, but you, did, I, we didn't talk about this. So what it is. Do we ever? <laughs> no, but I just want people to know that we don't. <laughs> and it works better for me in the book a little bit more than it, it works in the movies a little bit. But what you don't understand in it is how much Ben loves Beverly. They all love Bev. But it, when they're children, Ben oh, is such a fat It took kid, me a minute. Okay. And he loves Beverly so much. And there's just no way for him to express it in a way that he feel Because he, there, he can't imagine, and as a fat kid growing up, he can't imagine her ever being interested, returning it, returning the affection. And the best he can do is write this one poem, and it explains it a little bit more in the book, and it's a haiku. Your hair is winter fire, January embers, my heart burns there, too. And in the book is, he wasn't crazy about it, but it was the best he could do. He was afraid that if he frigged around with it too long, worried it too much, he would end up getting the jitters and doing something much worse, or not doing it at all, and he didn't want that to happen. The moment she had to taken to speak to him had been a striking moment for Ben, and he wanted to mark it in his memory. 
Probably, probably Beverly had a crush on some bigger boy, six or seven, or maybe even a seventh grader, and she would think that maybe that boy had sent the haiku. That would make her happy, and so the day she got it would be marked in her memory. And although she would never know it had been Ben Hanscom who marked it for her, that was all right. He would know. The thing is, he just wants to make her happy. Yeah. Jessica it Tet hits a little harder in the book than it does the movies because yes. it's the time to understand. It's not about him. It's not about him. No. He just wants to make her happy. Sorry, it's just funny yeah. that you went that way, and I ended with what I thought was going to be the most serious, what, what I thought was the most serious one. Jessica Chastain or Annette O'Toole? My, me personally? Yeah. Who? Well, now, are you asking me who I'd rather go out with or who played the role better? Who would you Who would you write the poem to? Jessica Chastain. Joe, James? I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, Jessica Rabbit. What? Nothing? <laughs> but if you ask me, Chad, who I thought was better at Beverly, it's Annette O'Toole. Oh, yeah. She had more She had more to, to deal with than that horrible sequel. James, pick. That's you got to pick. a movie with a lot answer. of casting. James never I, answers, I, folks. James, answer. No, I just, I, 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 Chad, I've never thought about this and given it this much thought. I don't, I mean, I would, I would. Don't think. Answer. Yeah, I agree with you. Okay. See, see what you made me do? I had Chad, to which one Joe. would you? Jessica. Yeah. Okay. She's a really great actress. I just don't think that's a very good movie. It no, it's not. do her any favors. Okay. But Bill Hader was born to play that part and is good in the movie, but mm -mm. terrible movie. James. Uh, Man, I have so many honorable mentions. But he's mentions. no Harry Dean. Harry, Harry, nah, fuck it up. I have Harry so many Anderson. honorable mentions. He's no of Harry one, Dean Stanton. Yeah. One, of, one of mine, oddly enough, is another Stephen King one i i couldn't have predicted that we, we'd have three i do really? i don't know but i i'm a, I'm really, really fucker. i still don't think my i, no, I don't think he wrote it either I, I i agree with you 100 percent. can i can i just say for our listeners um what just happened to me uh while we were recording i grabbed what i thought was hand sanitizer because he was I, masturbating to james and women's closet <laughs> no i i just That's, do that it happen but, I've never but uh, it turns out it's not. It's a Frizz Ease uh, Serum Extra Strength for hair. And my hands all feel weird, very weird right and now. And now Chad's bush has never been more glorious. <laughs> now, I was gonna say, now, now, his, now his hair on the back of his hands are completely coiffed. Oh, it is it's coiffed the hair on it. palms. It's really bothering me, Dr. Thomas. It's, it's, our, palms. <laughs> it's Argan Coconut and Moringa Oil. And oh, oh thank God there's paper can towels you, here. Can you, can My you, God, it looks like I am set up for masturbation. Can you French fry? Can you fry French fries and moringa oil? I don't know what that is, but I try. No, you one. put it on top of pie. Mm. Moringa. Mm. I like a big thick moringa. Yuck. James, I, I like to I like to dance the moringa. James, um, what's your last pick? My last pick. You know what? I'm gonna go back to comic books because it doesn't get enough credit. Chad's gonna know this one pretty quickly, I think. Yeah, pretty. But I, I just appreciate it. it's another one that I read when I was a kid, and it just got burned into my memory. So, uh, gentlemen, change, change, O oh form of man, free the prince forever damned, <laughs> free the might from fleshy mire, boil the blood in the heart for fire. Gone, gone, O oh form of man, rise man. the demon, Etrigan. Etrigan. The demon from, from DC Comics. Jason Blood is possessed by a demon. More or less, and Chad, correct me if I'm wrong, but he's rendered immortal. Yeah. But yeah. The, but he carries a demon with him the rest of his life. Yep. And he he can call forth the demon. And even though the demon is evil, he tries to use the demon to do good. And he calls it forth most of the time. Most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. He calls forth the demon to stop. And so this, I mean, this is the demon that has teamed up with Superman, teamed up with all these heroes. But he's a demon. He wants to hurt people. He's not. And it's Etrigan. And when Etrigan gets tired of dealing with the world of man, by the way, the poem that Etrigan recites is Be gone, be gone, O Etrigan. Resume once more the form of man. Gone now, O Etrigan, and rise once more the form of man. Man, yeah. Um, but it's, again, it's something I read when I was a kid. And just this idea, like, you know, when I was a kid, they reintroduced Ghost Rider, and it was Danny Catch, and he changed by grabbing 
uh, the the thing on the motorcycle and changing. And the old Ghost Rider changed at night. I thought Etrigan was fascinating. Uh, and I believe Chad correct me if I'm wrong. He's, uh, I mentioned Jack Kirby earlier, co-created by Jack Kirby. Um, but it was just fascinating that you could, this was just a poem. And if you recited this poem, you could call forth this demon to take over your form and do your fighting for you. Yeah, this fire-breathing, like, spawn of hell who would would kind of like hulkish but not as powerful yeah just literally would would rip apart anything in his path yeah and so i was fascinated by that as a kid and i, I chad i think you, that's a good parallel it was it was not exact it was somewhere between for for a marvel comparison if you're a marvel person it was somewhere between the incredible hulk and ghost rider mm-hmm and it, but it's the fact that literally, as long as you can speak, you can summon forth this power from within you. And it took your form, it took your place, and it just wreaked havoc. Mm-hmm. And so I, it's it's burned into my memory. It's and so that, that's another one that when I was saying poems and pop culture, and I said I've got I've got some honorable mentions, but that was one I had to say as well because it's just in my mind. All right, real quick with honorable mentions, I yeah. only have two things, if you don't mind, if I don't go, because I well, really wanted to talk. I'm sorry. Well, I was just, it was my turn. I was just going to do one. Oh, okay. Okay. Go. I'm sorry, Chad. I just, no. I did, I, what I was about to do, no one was going to do. So, okay. sorry. well, no, I'll just quickly do mine because I honestly, the reason I did beans is because I thought James was going to do this one. Um, because it's the, when you think of pop culture poems, this is the epitome of pop culture poems. Once a pot of midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volumes of forgotten lore. While I nodded nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping as of someone gently rapping, rapping on my chamber door. Tis a visitor and uh, muttered entreating entrance on my chamber door. This is a, a nothing. Oh, no, hold on. Stop, stop, stop. Best adaptation, Simpsons. Simpsons. This, actually, and that, that, that's what I was going to say is that's where most people. And I, I know James might, I don't know if James will argue with me. I think the majority of our population got introduced to the Raven from Treehouse of Horror. Uh, I do. think, I think of a certain age, I think, because my mom would argue, and it wouldn't be me or my mom would argue it's been surprised. Well, of course. Yeah. I think, uh, Chad, so I think, I think you're both right, but it's, it's probably it, it, is it's, it's, we were talking about which is your star Wars earlier, right? Yeah, and it's right. age based. It's the same thing, but now oddly enough, when James Earl Jones sadly passed away, I don't say sadly, he's in his nineties. I, I won't make it that long. Um, but no of a lie. Uh, but a lot of people were Star Wars, Star Wars, and, and don't get me wrong, I love Star Wars. Please don't attack me. But my first thought was, oh, to mark this, and I, I put it on the Simpsons episode because he also does a couple other voices in that episode. But and then it got to the Raven, and I was like, man, it's just James Earl Jones. The fact that the Simpsons had James Earl Jones perform the Raven, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah it's beautiful. I mean, yeah, because it's funny, but at the same time, you just hear. There's three people performing the Raven that I absolutely love, and several people have performed. Uh, but that's one of them: James Earl yeah. Jones on The Simpsons, Vincent Price, Vincent Price, and Christopher Walken. If you God ever get to hear he... Christopher Walken do it, what? I was gonna, I was gonna say something smartass, and you beat me to it, so I'm not gonna do it now. Actually, you know somebody I wish would have done it. Now, if anybody did, if he did do it at some point, and I don't know about it, mm-hmm. I actually would. And I, I say this sincerely. I wonder how Gilbert Godfrey would have done. <laughs> and I mean that honestly. I would listen. Once I would upon listen. a midnight dreary. Because honestly, that I'd feel so, uh, sorry for the Raven. <laughs> like when he shrieks up, starting at the Raven. Yeah. See, I'm quoting the poem. I'd be like, man, that poor Raven is like, hey, hey, quiet it down. Yeah, that's a, that's my honorable mention. I just I was shocked that James no, didn't right. bring it up. I, it it came up, but there's so many that were just from pop culture. I wouldn't do that. So yes, it was on my mind though because I did. That's when I heard James Earl Jones died. After I finished work, I went home and listened. And then brief, questions. brief. It's not a poem. It's a nursery rhyme. But Solomon Grundy, born on a Monday, yeah. born on a Sunday. So yeah. Anyway, yep. James, Joe, go ahead. Uh, mine actually. There's a couple, but I'm just going to talk about one real quick. It's uh, Blade Runner when um, when Roy Batty quotes uh, William Blake's America of Prophecy. He doesn't really talk about it. It's just kind of in dialogue. I didn't realize that he rewrote a couple of the words, and it changes the whole dynamic and the meaning of it. And it's so much so, and I'm not going to read it because we're doing honorable mentions. This is, if you want to delve into this, Google it. And then Google a little bit of when it talks about Alien Covenant and David, 
he actually gives credit to Ozymandias to the wrong author. And it's supposed to be connected as far as the nexuses and the AI. And it's it's fascinating. But they did it all on purpose. Hmm. James. Uh, James. All right. I, I've Finish got a few up, honorable mentions. Bring us home. We'll end it. I, I've got a few honorable mentions. I'll start with the Stephen King one I alluded to earlier. It is actually a Stephen King one that's burned into my memory. It's not from a book. And I will read it quickly. Here they store what came before, pain and suffering from days of yore, before and after, tears and laughter, after comes before, before comes after, past and future, and then hereafter. The naked and the dead, the young and the old, their stories in here, their tales untold. Here sickness and death have left their pages, written in blood for all the ages. Someday your story will be here too. It is the ghostly doctor from Kingdom Hospital standing in the morgue in the almost, it may be the last episode of Kingdom Hospital. They do a flashback, and that's not the main part of the thing, but they keep talking about this evil doctor that was in the hospital way back in the day, Dr. Egis Gottreich. Um, and, and you finally see him in ghostly form at the start of an episode, and he just recites that poem, and then it cuts away. And. And a really quick but that scene you, is burned into my head. Uh, is uh, he thrusts his fists against the post and still insists he sees a ghost? Actually, isn't Stephen King? It's from Donovan's Brain, the novel by Carl Kurt Sinemak, who also wrote The Wolfman. Yeah, ah, that's because he was a huge. Uh, just sorry, James. Yeah, no, no. So, uh, but that that scene is burned into my head. Stephen King. Uh, I mean. You all are the bigger Stephen King fans. I appreciate Stephen King, but oh, that man. that that scene is burned into my head. Um, and I do want to give some honorable mention to video games as we're talking about pop culture. I'll do two of those really quick. Um, I can see what you uh, I can see what you see not. Visions milky, then eyes rot. When you turn, they will be gone, whispering their hidden song. Then you see what cannot be. Shadow move where light should be. Out of darkness, out of mind, cast down into the halls of the blind. That is the poem that is, quote-unquote, read to you when you enter the halls of the blind in the first game in the Diablo series. It's burned into my head as well, because I played that when I was probably 13, and I can remember hearing it just creepily comes on when you enter that part of the game, and it reads it to you. This one's a little bit fun and tied to uh, LucasArts, if I remember correctly. With bony hands, I hold my partner. On soulless feet, we cross the floor. The music stops as if to answer, an empty knocking at the door. It seems his skin was as sweet as mango when last I held him to my breast. But now we dance this grim fandango and will for years until we rest. That's from the video game Grim, Fam grim Fandango from LucasArts. All right. So the video game reference, but so point is poetry pops up in all pop culture we've kind of shown that if there's some that we've missed make comments we'll read them we actually will we promise it'd be nice to hear from you all oh one more one more quick when it, whenever joe talks i have to say this well i'm rubber and you're glue whatever you say bounces off to me <laughs> And sticks to oh, you. Dude, he screwed it up. He added a two in there. Did we I? Could do it he said off to me. We could Shit. do an entire episode of rhyming insults from Welcome Back Carter. Uh, Ka uh, Mr. Cotet. And with that. Up your nose with, with a, a rubber, rubber hose, hose. Twice as far with a Hershey bar. This has been Bumphead Weekly. Grrrr. <sighs>